It is 105. I want to respect everybody's time. Thank you for joining us. This is Positive Coaching Alliance webinar celebrating uh, Hispanic Latinx communities. The, our, our title for today is Celebrating Heritage and Empowering the Future. My name is Alejandro Vilches, and I'm going to be moderating the conversation today between our two panelists and also getting some questions from the audience. Um, we, uh, Like I said, we're here to celebrate uh, Hispanic Heritage Month, and our title for the webinar today is Exploring Youth Sports in Hispanic Latinx Communities. And, you know, we're... we're Hispanic Heritage Month started, you know, con el grito uh, down, I think, uh, September 15th on Thursday to Friday, um, and it lasts the whole 30 days. Um, and so, you know, I know Positive Coaching Alliance is doing, I don't want to say doing its part, but really honoring uh, just Hispanic Latinx communities, particularly as it it it, uh, it involves youth sports. And so our conversation is going to be through the lens of youth sports, and we're going to explore some deeply rooted values, challenges, successes, and aspirations that shape the lives of Hispanics and Latinx youth. So as you're joining us, if you're just joining us right now, please share your name, your location, and how you identify yourself culturally. And that, it, it's a key question before we get into this because the Hispanic community um, is so broad and so big, and it, there's a lot of different um, origin stories, if, if, if you may. Uh, my, I'll just give you a quick introduction of, of myself. So, yo soy cubano y mexicano. My dad is Cuban and my mom is Mexican, and I grew up here on the West Coast, specifically in Northern California in the Bay Area. Um, and I love my Cuban roots, I love my Mexican roots, but I identify as Chicano uh, because I grew up uh, in that scene, kind of speaking Spanglish. Um, and so politically, socially, historically, that's that's how I identify. And it's not to deny any any other part of my heritage, but that's how I, how I, how I identify. So. Um, before we get into it, we, we want to make sure that people just kind of share how, how is it that they identify culturally. I don't know if the chat is is uh, fixed. All good. Thank you for joining us. Please use the Q&A to post questions for us to address towards the end of the session. Yes, please. If you have any questions or comments, please make sure you put it uh, in the Q&A. Um, so let's just go ahead and get started. We have two very quality quality and qualified professionals, colleagues, camaradas, uh, who are joining our conversation today. I first want to introduce Dr. Julian Alonso Restrepo. He's from Colombia, and he's the assistant professor for sports and leadership and administration at the University of Massachusetts in Boston. Um, he's dedicated his efforts to scholarship that focuses on grassroots programming, grassroots programs, community engagement, and sports, sport-based youth development. So muchas gracias. Dr. Restrepo. Um, also joining us is Lupe Flores, uh, who is a director of engagement and, and impact uh, at the director of engagement and impact at the Chicano Federation um, in San Diego. And she's done extensive work in advocacy and community engagement, as well as using her passion for increased leadership development for youth to create and implement a not a no cost youth sport for development academy in San Diego County. So bienvenida, welcome. Lupe. Um, so here, here's, oh, just FYI, just to be transparent, we had a third panelist. Her name is Brenda Villa, and she wasn't able to join us uh, last minute. She got a, a call for work, and so she wasn't able to join us. But if you may, you may remember back in the 2012 uh, Summer Olympic Games, um, she won a gold medal for in water polo. Um, and she's actually a, a friend of mine, and I, I was really bummed that she wasn't going to be here because we worked here work together over here in the Bay Area. So just FYI, it's not like we're trying to cut anybody cut anybody short, but that was kind of a last minute change. So we will miss you, Brenda. All right, let's jump into it. Got a couple of questions. Um, and before we get into it, I, I just wanna throw out, you know, as we discuss, you know, we're, we're honoring our heritage and legacy from traditional games to modern initiatives. Uh, we wanna uncover how much sports enrich our, our identity and community. Um, and so before we get into it, and, and anybody could start, what sports did you play growing up? Like, what's, what's your origin story? I, I, we talked about cultural identity, but real quickly, maybe in 15, 20 seconds, Dr. Restrepo, Lupe, what sports did you, did you play? Um, maybe you played one sport, maybe you played many sports, but what, what's your story? 
Yeah, I, I can go first. Uh, thank you to, to PCA and Alejandro for the great introduction and, and the platform. Um, I grew up playing basketball, was an avid lover of baseball, watching it, um, football, which is soccer here in the States. Um, I was also a competitive cheerleader and dancer. So I've kind of been in, in all spaces of, of youth sports. Nice. Get down. And and who who did that come from? Like, who pushed you of your parents, maybe your grandparents, or what family members kind of encouraged you and motivated you to get into those? Yeah, I think it all came from my mama. You know, all all the time, it's it's uh, the women in our families pushing us to to really better ourselves. And you know, um, I lost my dad at a young age, so she really wanted me to to be distracted, busy. Um, like I said, bettering myself through through skills and development and sports. Awesome. Thank you, Lupe. So it really sounds like mom really just pushed you and motivated you. Gracias. How about you, Dr. Resnepo? What is your story? What sports did you play? Who pushed you? Who motivated you? Who like, who? I don't want to say who forced you, but you know, our, par our parents parents could be strongly, they could strong arm encourage sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. Well, first of all, thanks for having me, Alejandro, and uh, the PCA for, for putting this together. Um, I'm going to have to also go with Lupe. My my mother was a big encouragement for me to get into sports and, and being physically active. I was a very active child. Um, and so it, it was an outlet for me to like burn some energy, right? I did a lot of sports sampling as well. Um, I was involved uh, baseball as a young kid, basketball as a young kid. I tried wrestling, lacrosse, track in, in high school. But the one sport that really stuck with me was American football. Um, I started playing football in middle school and played high school, eventually ended up going into coaching. Um, but for me, my influence was my peers in that space, uh, mostly because uh, where I was living and just in general, uh, Latinos are not really seen or involved in American football. And so access to that sport um, was more uh, influenced by my friends and, and potentially their parents and, and their encouragement for me to play a sport that was not typically um, played in my my uh, heritage, you know. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Estrepo. I, I love a couple of things that you said. You said sports sampling, right? So like, like you you tried. I'm at the, I, I like that. I never heard that before. So thank you for that. Um, and, and I like the fact, and, and Lupe, you also alluded to it, like you're separating American football versus football right and i know if you if, if you don't speak spanish sometimes it's like well what's what's the difference well there's a big difference right not not only in the sport but actually in how you pronounce it and how you spell it so football american football double ot and then football is f with the u and the accent right so thank you for clarifying that if you're just joining us please make sure you put in your name your city and one of the things that we what we're asking is, um, how do you identify yourself culturally? We're asking the audience, so please make sure to put that in in the chat. But real quickly, Lupe and Dr. Restrepo, how do you how do you identify culturally? Some people say Hispanic, Latino, Latino, Latinx, uh, uh, Chicano, Mexicana, Mexican. How do you identify really quickly? Yeah. Um... I would say that I have two, right? I interchange them often. Latina, because my, my mother's from Mexico and um, of Latin American, a Latin American country, but also Chicana. I, I grew up in East LA, um, which was really the environment for the Chicano movement. And I, I recognize the history that, that comes with that and how it was really a product of that environment. So yeah, I, I identify as Latina, Chicana, um, and a lot of that having ties to, to me identifying as a female and knowing that um, Latinas, Chicanas, female identifying folks are sometimes left out of sports spaces, I think is important and always putting that first. Orale, gracias, Lupe. Julian, how do you identify culturally? I know you were born in Colombia, and but you're here in the States and I, I don't know your whole story, but how do you identify? Yeah, you know, uh, Colombian is, is uh, my nationality. I'm Latino. I, I, uh, oftentimes refer myself as Latino, Hispanic, um, but I was raised in the New York City area. I was raised in the Northeast. We like to call ourselves New Yorkans. Anybody that's Latino that lives in New York is a New Yorkan. Um, and so I was able to uh, grow up with a mixture of Latino cultures in, in Queens, New York. And so um, that's how I identify as a New Yorkan. Thank you. Thanks to both of you. All right, let's jump into some of the questions. So the first one goes is going to Dr. Estrepo. 
How have Hispanic Latinx cultural values influenced the participation and approach to youth sports within our communities? And that could be you know, the institutional approach or maybe a league approach, community approach, or maybe a parent approach. Um, but how have, how have those cultural values influenced participation and the approach to, to get involved? And, and I have a backup question because when we talk about the cultural values, I'd also like to name like what are our Chicano, Latino, Hispanic, Latinx, what are those values? That's kind of a second question, yeah. but let, let's take the first one first. Yeah, no, I thank you for your question. And I actually, you know, thinking about this, I think the first question is what are our Latino cultural values? I think exactly. that's what we have to uh, set first. Um, and so I'm not attempting to, nor do I want to attempt to generalize for hundreds of millions of people that are Latino, Hispanic in this world. Um, but some of the, the most valued Hispanic uh, or Latinx cultural values that we have is, is family, uh, community, interdependency between each other, and then collectivism, right? Those are, those are pretty well, um, well-known values across all, all cultures. Um, so our youth participation and approach to sport is absolutely going to be influenced by those uh, Latinx values, right? Um, in the sports for our Latino youth, uh, there are space to engage in community building, right? There are a space to engage uh, and gain mutual respect for one another. Uh, and so that's how it directly ties into our, our cultural values. Um, however, sport is also a space that um, allows us and teaches us, or we learn how to refute some of those uh, racialized stereotypes that we have about uh, our culture, right? Um, all youth participation is, is impacted uh, by the variables of gender, socioeconomic status, and language. And so we're all going to have different experiences based on those variables and those identities that we hold. Um, and, and those, of course, greatly influence how youth, Latino youth, participate in sport. Uh, so any intersecting barriers uh, with those variables can reduce sport uh, involvement, um, specifically for, let's say, Latina uh, teenage girls. Mm -hmm. um, and so how do our cultural values influence sport participation? Well, we use Latinos utilize sport, uh, and it helps us to facilitate things like uh, immigrant youth that are coming into our country, second generation Latinos uh, that live in our urban societies um, and that are in mainstream American culture, right? Um, so we use sport uh, to engage with those new societies, but it also allows us to maintain our own personal ethnic identities. Um, and that's what I'm really excited to talk about you all today. Thank you, doctor. So just in summary, you know, just it, it, it helps us reach the, the different, um, not only generations, but the different, I don't wanna say levels, but the different waves of, of our communities coming in, whether it be recién llegados, you know, recent immigrants to those who have been here, you know, first, second, or possibly even third generation. Yeah. So gracias for that. Lupe, I don't know if you wanna chime in, but I, I am interested in hearing what, what you think some of the values are. I know Dr. Estrepo talked about familia, comunidad, community, interdependency, and collectivism. Anything to add or maybe a check mark like times two, like yes, times two or times a hundred, or or are there any different cultural values that that you would add that 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 uh, that we bring to the table? Yeah, I think um yes, times two on everything Dr. Restrepo said. Um, but also, you know, understanding that that sport in, in our youth we can use now as, as a vehicle for leadership and and really emphasizing that for, for our kids and um, anyone really involved involved in the sport. Awesome. So yeah, just using it as a vehicle for leadership. Thank you. This one goes directly to Lupe. Lupe, could you share some success stories or maybe some successful initiatives that have successfully promoted diversity, inclusion, equal opportunities for Hispanic Latinx youth in uh, in sports? Yeah, I can actually talk a little bit about the work I do um, at Chicano Federation. Like you mentioned in my bio, we do a lot of work in, in soccer or football. Um, and what was really intentional is, is training our staff, our coaches, and really anyone involved in the academy to be LGBTQ plus friendly. Um, like Dr. Restrepo said, our, our communities are not a monolith. There's intersection to it all. Um, and kids that come into sport have so many identities nowadays 
which are all important to them. And, and we shouldn't have to have them put away a piece of themselves just so that they can play, um, you know, in a match or whatnot. So letting them know that they're welcome and um, the environment is always going to be friendly. But also going back to what he said, too, about um, our female identifying players and, and our young girls, um, we've seen it as a society, as, as Latinx um, communities that, you know, sometimes you grow up in a, a machista household with, with a dad who says, you know, you either go to school, you go to work, you stay and, and you help out the family, you take care of the kids. And, and our young uh, girls are not necessarily always encouraged to to take on a sport or or involve themselves. So um, I'd say a lot of the work that I do is is putting that forward, making sure that we're LGBTQ plus friendly, but also helping families understand, like I said, that that sport can be a vehicle for leadership for for our, our niñas and and um, how they can be leaders. And you know, it's not just for for boys or um, males or anyone who identifies with that. It's for everyone, and and everyone gets a lot of you know, value and growth from it. So I'd say successful initiatives are always going to have to do with intersectional identities and making sure we're welcoming of all of them. Yeah. And I really like what you said that they're able to show up as their whole selves, not coming in like, okay, I got to leave this part behind, you know, before I go to practice or go to a game or just go mm -hmm. into some type of league or sport, but they're able to come as a whole. Good assets for that. Um, Dr. Estrepo, any, anything to add, any success stories or initiatives that you've seen or maybe you've been part of um, that promote, you know, diversity, inclusion, and just equal opportunities for, for our young people, particularly in Latinx and, and Hispanic communities? No, I just want to uh, emphasize Lupe's point of, of our idea of when we do develop programs, when we think about our communities, uh, we don't think of it in one lane, but intersecting uh, all the different variables in that um, contribute to sport participation, whether it's gender, uh, socioeconomic status, religion, language, um, educational status, uh, parental status, all these aspects of what make us who we are um, are going to impact of, of our participation in sport. And so the more ways we could think about those different identities, um, I think that is what creates a success story as far as initiatives. Thank you to both of you. Couple couple things came up, and I, I know I got a script of questions, and and then I tend to like branch off of. Them. I'll make sure to keep them related. So going back to the original question, like what are our cultural values? You mentioned community, familia, interdependency, and collectivism. When do those then do those values that we bring in as a people? When have you seen them clash, particularly when it comes to uh, leagues, um, maybe club or travel ball? Um, when do some of those, or, or or don't maybe they don't clash? When have they when have they integrated themselves smoothly, and but or when have they clashed? And then the next question will be: What are some of the unique challenges or barriers barriers that our community faces in accessing? But let's let's take the first one first. What when have you seen them clash? And then what are some of those unique challenges? And I'll 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 kind of put it out to to either of you, whoever wants to start. Thank you, Alejandro. I'll, I'll give it a shot for the first one. So as far as clashing values and cultural values, right, um, as we mentioned, uh, this idea of interdependency is, is pretty important to us, right? We, we come together, we work together, we rely on each other for, for success, right? Um, oftentimes, we're pushed into team-oriented sports, right? Sports that uh, are work, we're working together, we're, we are taught collaboration, we're taught um, collectivism, right? And, and those are the sports in which potentially Latinos are, are mostly or, or pushed to play, right? Whereas in other cultural values are more focused on um, independency, right? Rather than interdependency. They're about being independent. So more cultural value can be placed on uh, single player sports and sports in where um, uh, golf, uh, boxing, um, uh, sports in which you tennis, where you only have one individual player that is competing at a time. And so there can be clashes in where um, Latinos uh, may potentially prefer team oriented sports, but are only offered singular sports, right? Sports for, for singular players or singular athletes. Um, so the values that we hold and the importance of collectivism 
um, can clash when we're placed in a space that puts more effort or emphasis on uh, independency rather than interdependency. Thank you. Good examples. Lupe, any 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 thoughts on that? Want to chime in on that? Yeah, I, I would say um, uh, an area where I've seen it clash because I work mainly in the team sport area is it goes back to culturally, you know, we, we're taught keep your head down, work hard, you're going to get noticed, right? Um, so even when you're on a team, you might be contributing everything you have to making sure that that, that team is successful um, and you hope to get noticed. And and the fact of the matter is, is that a lot of our Latino kids never do um, because they have that mindset of, you know what, mi mamá, mi papá, they, they taught me, keep my head down. If I work hard enough and I, I know I'm working hard, I'm going to get noticed. Um, unfortunately, with some of the systems and institutions that we have in this country, that, that isn't always the case or ever the case, really, uh, where their talent is recognized. Yeah, I I, um, I, I was kind of resonating with both of you just saying I started thinking about professional sports, right, um, where we see a lot of Latino, you know, Hispanic, Latinx, our communities represented in some sports. And maybe not as represented in other sports, but that doesn't mean that we don't play it, you know, at the mm -hmm. at the either at the collegiate level or the high school or even at the community level. Um, all right, let, so kind of the second the second part of the question is, what are some of the unique challenges or barriers that our young people are facing in in accessing um, and participating actively in some of these sports, and and how how are you seeing these challenges being addressed, or are they even being addressed? Yeah, um, I can start off by saying uh, the number one barrier is, is the access, right? Um, our, our kids aren't, aren't getting enough access to, to sport um, or not getting enough access to free sport. And, and I say free and no cost because that's very important to families, um, whether they're single parent households, um, regardless of income status, free sports are really important in making sure that they're accessing the sport in general. And then they can sport sample and see, you know, what they like and what they don't like. But if it if it's going to cost them two hundred dollars, the family is not going to always commit to those two hundred dollars to make sure that their kid might like the sport. Um, so I will say access and and the way we we should be combating that is is or supporting organizations that that are really driving that no cost model, because unfortunately in the states um, there's pay to play models all over the place in whatever sport you're looking at in in baseball, you have travel ball and soccer youth clubs really kind of dominate the, the soccer space. Um, when in other countries, we see talent kind of coming out of, of every corner of the, of the community. And so I would say that to combat that, we really need to, to challenge that pay to play model that, that these youth clubs who think that they're saviors and, and bestowing upon these, these scholarships to these few kids from certain neighborhoods isn't enough. We need to be uh, really supporting organizations that are driving forward no cost models so that kids have the opportunity to even decide if they like the sport and then also grow in it. Gracias, Lupe. Dr. Estrepo, any challenges, unique opportunities? What have you seen when it comes to access? And 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 I'll give you I'll give you kind of a sub question. Is finances the the main the main access challenge or are there other challenges? Thank you for that. No, I harp on what Lupe said as far as uh, access and affordability. I mean, affordability uh, for for any for any youth, regardless of racial, cultural background, um, affordability is going to have a, a large impact. Socioeconomic family status plays a big impact of um, not only how much sport, but which sports you do get access to. Right. Um, I think. Um, talking about other barriers besides funding is representation. And as one, one you've already mentioned, right? Um, are we, do we have programs that are hiring bilingual coaches uh, that have multicultural uh, mentors in place, right? Um, there's a lot of different culturally responsive practices that organizations can apply into their programs that can make it more accessible and more walking, welcoming for Hispanic and Latinx uh, families, right? Um, and so uh, we could look at programs as far as uh, what safety protocols they have in place, right? That make it, doesn't make it accessible for, for our youth. Um, 
Do the kids feel like they belong? Do they have opportunities to belong, to celebrate their cultures when they're in that sport place? Um, what are some of the opportunities that we provide for skill building? And, and so as we think of these different areas that we can apply um, culture into our sport programs, I think that's what creates more accessibility outside of, yes, we need funding for these kids to be able to play. Um, but let's layer that with culturally responsive practices that our organization can apply to make it a inclusive environment. Awesome. Thank you. Really rich conversation. Go ahead, Lupe. I will, I will add another little piece um, uh, outside of the funding barrier, but um, parental kind of, you know, ability to understand these systems is, is a huge barrier as well, right? Sometimes um, our parents, our guardians, the ones who are, are putting these kids in these sports don't know how to navigate it. Um, don't know how to find either that free um, program or if they're one of the the few that get you know that scholarship to that club don't know how to go from there you know how often are tournaments uh, how do we get there uh, where do I get your uniform um, and, and all of that always comes back to you know cultural sensitivity language understanding that that we need to be putting out all of this for for our families and for our kids to feel comfortable like they belong but also for their families as a whole to feel like they belong yeah, that's dope. I mean, it just it just it's not just the access part in terms of finance, but there's just so many other different avenues. So um, let, let me put a scenario. I'm kind of going off script, but let me let me put a scenario. We, we know that there are there are challenges and barriers to access. And we've also seen maybe for on a, on a few that some people do. They 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 work really hard. The families, you know, behind them. I, I'm looking at some of the. Um, some of the comments right here in the chat, like lack of parental support. And, and those are very general, you know, the financial, but there, there are some that, and I want to say get through, but they, they're, their families behind them. Um, once they, once, and somebody wrote like in figure skating representation is very low, which is true, but let's just take a scenario where let's take uh, me, I'm going to go Alejandra. What if Alejandra or Alejandro makes it to figure skating and I get real far now that I'm there, what are the what are the challenges that exist once I'm there? So we've got the challenges to access, but there are some that do access. Are there challenges there? And what are those challenges? I I would say the first um, kind of challenge that pops into mind is once you get there, once you're at that elite level, you you go back into that mentality of keep my head down. Uh, work hard and and I'll be unproblematic. I won't use this platform to you know bring other folks up or or whatnot. Um, but really the the realm of the sport can often do that to you too, right? Like, hey, you're lucky you got here. Um, don't cause any problems. Don't cause any commotion. Um, you're lucky you got here. Let's make sure that that you stay here, kind of thing. Um, I think that's a, a big challenge as a whole in sport, right? Uh, we don't want those token players we want them to know that they can make it big time bring other people along bring their communities along and again going back to identity not have to shut a certain part of themselves out to be able to hold to show up as our whole selves yeah thank you lupe dr estrepo anything to add what what are the challenges that maybe somebody faces once they have gotten there absolutely I, you know and i think um lupe made a great point uh, another challenge I'd like to add on there is is breakdown of stereotypes, right? Uh, when we are in spaces uh, where we are sometimes seen as the token or one of very few or this uh, anomaly of an athlete or coach or whatever it is, uh, then we're faced with stereotypes. Um, and how do we navigate around those stereotypes? Um, do we uh, subconsciously embrace them? And, and, and act on them, or do we uh, challenge them and challenge the systems and the mindsets around us? Um, if we are breaking down barriers, then we also need to break down stereotypes. And I think that's one uh, barrier that we'll see in, in, in that space. I, I'm so, uh, I, so, I don't know if I'm happy or glad, but I, you both mentioned the word tokenism and tokens. And how much does that play out either within our community or outside of the community when we are trying to make it, you know, in, in different institutions, not just sports, but and that's kind of a whole other, uh, a whole other level of the conversation. But I'll, I'll just, I'll just ask, what, what does tokenism look like when it comes to our community 
and and sports and maybe we can take it in different levels like maybe collegiate or club ball or high school but is there tokenism and if so what is that what does that look like yeah um i will say at, at, at kind of the professional level um in in latinas and, and girls too they're they're very few and far between in, in professional sports um and and these systems who kind of like grow them and bring them to you know let's say the national team level um, think that they don't have to do anything different to bring more of them on, right? Um, we've checked that box. The Latinos on our team, um, we don't have to go into youth clubs and look for more. We don't have to, you know, change our system as a whole. Um, and I think that externally that plays a big part in discouraging our, our girls and, and Latinos in general from, from really trying to, to get to that level. But also... Um, Internally, I think the way we challenge it is that, you know, we need to be proud of our, our identities and um, not perpetuate stereotypes and um, understand that that if you're leading with that, that, that it's commitment to a community. It's so much more than just yourself. Thank you, Lupe. Any additions or differences or I don't know, just, I, I'm going to put it over to you, Dr. Estrepo. Tokenism, your thoughts. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um... I think the lens I bring to this is, is at the collegiate level, uh, when we're talking about, uh, for example, um, uh, teams in, in, at the collegiate level that are not very diverse, uh, but sometimes are seen in, in diverse uh, lenses. Uh, for example, our, our soccer, our football teams, um, our baseball teams at the collegiate level um, are still dominated with uh, white and, and, and Eurocentric uh, athletes. However, uh, we know that Hispanic and Latinos play these sports at large quantities. Um, and so when we then recruit an international or Latino athlete to play in these teams, and now they're centered and surrounded by whiteness um, and in a, a white institution, um, that tokenism is really emphasized. Um, and they're put on a, a pedestal and asked sometimes to uh, perform at a higher level. Uh, accomplish things that perhaps their other teammates don't have to accomplish or, or feel stresses that because they have an identity that other people around them don't have or they're in a uh, historically white space, they're feeling stressors that they haven't potentially felt back at home, right? Um, and so it's this idea of, of um, like Lupe said, still being your authentic self and being able to prove that you who you are is good enough to be where you need to be um and, and the rest of it um um it, it's a, a tricky space to navigate yeah yeah thank you i want to um excuse me i've got a phone call <laughs> i want to just honor some of the chat um and shannon i, I you know i just want to throw out my pca colleagues right there i didn't i wasn't able to do it in the beginning but it, so it looks like we got a full group right now um so I wanna just recognize Reggie Garcia and Rashina Joyner, and obviously Shannon Love who are working behind the scenes um, to put this uh, this webinar together. So I just wanna acknowledge them. Um, Shannon, could we, could we throw out some of the questions that were, I know we got some questions beforehand and some of them were very specific about how do I get more uh, Latinos into, I think it was like uh, baseball leagues or maybe some of the questions. So I just wanna, Want to put that out on on you, Shannon, since you have some of those questions. Yeah, coming off mute here. <laughs> Thanks, Alejandro. So one question that was submitted prior was, um, as a government agency, how do we gain the trust needed needed to get Hispanics and Latinx communities involved in our programs? Awesome, great question. Anybody want to tackle that one? Well, I'm using like I'm I'm using sports terms. <laughs> I I can um tackle it first. Um, I will say you show up. Um, you you don't just throw uh funding or marketing at at communities. You you show up and you support organizations. Um, in the community, it, visibility and representation is always the number one thing that I think Latinos will identify with and respect. Right. Um, you're you're showing up in the community. You're making sure that parents and families know about pro these programs that you have. Um, you're making sure that you 
you understand their the intersectionalities of their identities, the the nuances to their lives and lived experiences. I think that's always number one important. You you increase diversity in your department. You 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 know it like going back to representation. If I um, if I didn't speak Spanish, I wouldn't feel as comfortable as I, I do in these spaces, but thankfully I do. And um, that goes a long way with, with familia and, 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 and anyone in the community. So I think that, that those are all little pieces that, that really help in making sure that you're increasing the participation. That's dope. Thank you, Lupe. Dr. Estrepo. Yeah, thank you. Um absolutely showing up and being part of the community. Um, and I'm gonna take a kind of academic lens to this, um, but I'd also like uh, research uh, that that's tied into our communities um, and, and research and evaluations and analysis about our sport landscapes, about what's being offered, uh, what our program needs, uh, where can funding go if funding is being provided by government. Um, and so with, with a kind of research lens, then we could have data and information that can be given to government agencies that allow for the um, uh, desertion of funding, uh, of opportunity, and, and of, of just support for that Latino community. Um, but to Lupe's point, we can't just throw money or marketing uh, without really understanding the core issues of our community. And that's where I think governments um, can be most of assistance or, or helpful is that uh, sport is a microcosm of society, right? If we have underlying social issues that enable or able us to play a sport, um, then our government has to look at those underlying issues before we can think about sport participation. Uh, because sport is just a mirror of what society it surrounds. Dr. Estrepo talked about, I mean, also coming from an academic lens, and I, I'm sure you do a lot of research. What research is not being done when it, as it relates to our community and youth sports? What, what, what still needs to happen? That's a great <laughs> question. Yeah. Um, uh, there's a lot that still needs to happen, right? Um, and, and because, again, we can't take a very generalizable approach to this. We can't say that the issues that Latinos face in Boston, New York, Philadelphia, Baltimore are the same issues that are seen in Los Angeles and San Diego and San Francisco. I mean, even across our own country, there are differences of, of uh, barriers and, and needs and wants that, that we all need, right? And so when we talk about research, um, yes, we can look at, um, at, at a national level, uh, but we can even break it down to the state level, right? Or the community and, and our, our, the city level. Like, what is it that each city needs um, to meet the specific wants and, and, and needs of that one community? Um, so there's a plethora of, of, of research still out there that needs to be done on, um, also, as mentioned earlier, the intersectionality of identities, right? It's not only uh, Latino youth, uh, but what about Latino youth that identify as transgender? Or what about Latino youth that identify uh, from low socioeconomic uh, families, right? Those are always going to have different um, uh, necessities than these large umbrella terms that we're using. Um, and so the research is, is about individuality, individualism and, uh, to those communities. Matt, I'm glad glad that you're in that space of just doing doing that research because I think a lot of times we uh, particularly as it comes to our community I don't think we take research um, me personally I don't think that enough research is done or even taken seriously um, it's always kind of like in the moment we got to do this all right I'm I'm looking through there's a man I, I wish I could read all the comments there's some good good healthy critical thinking questions and some um, some people supporting each other and giving each other information I did uh, this one popped up for me. Uh, it's from Jody Nelson, um, and she says, this is probably a different type of question for this, uh, but it relates. I ref youth and adult soccer and volleyball in Santa Barbara, California. I'm a small white female, which is already a very small group. If any, at least 75% of our community I ref is Latino. Uh, is Latino, and I have found that I am not respected and or listened to, and some have thought that when I make calls that I am being racially biased, which is very untrue, 
how can I combat this and work with these communities in a stronger union? Great, great question. Thank you for their courage and boldness in putting this out there, Jody. Anybody want to take that? Or not? <laughs> Lupe, Dr. Restrepo. I, I can try. Um, I, I guess Dr. Restrepo kind of touched on it that um, sport and, and taking part in sport is, is a cause of our society and other issues. Um, so I think at a like, kind of like a critical thinking level, Jody, it, it would, my advice would be understand these communities, um, you know, what's their backgrounds, um, how do they show up in your space and, and what causes them to, you know, accuse you of that. Maybe, you know, they have experience of, of having, you know, racial bias directed at them while playing the sport. Um, I think usually we, we take it out on folks because we, we've had an experience in it. Um, so I think my best advice would be to, to truly under, understand these communities and, and where they're coming from. Uh, maybe you have some regulars that you can, you feel comfortable enough talking to and be like, hey, what, what's so-and-so's um, kind of deal in, in this space and, and why do they play um, or, or other things? Um, so I think that's, that's my best shot at that question. Yeah. Thanks, Lupe. Thanks, Lupe, just for, just for putting it out there. Dr. Estrepo, any thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, my, my thought, um, one, um, I think this is not a, uh, isolated incident. I think across the nation, there is attack on, on our youth referees and our youth officiating. Uh, right now there's, I know there is a lack of officiating at, at uh, little leagues and, and pop Warner leagues. Um, and so then you add an extra layer of this racial bias or, uh, kind of racial tension on top of the fact that, right, that we are attacking our referees. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of uh, informal ways to approach it, right? Create, build a community with these folks, get to know the parents uh, at the organization more formally, having conversations with parents before the league starts, before the season starts, and talk about expectations and rules and, and, and behaviors and norms, positive norms that should be had happening in that space. Um, but I would say that this is, uh, this is a national problem. Uh, yeah. we're, we have all seen the videos of the helicopter parents uh, just belittling, belittling the, the Little League umpire, right? Um, and so I think this is a, a problem that's happening across all youth sports. Um, and unfortunately, when you add racial layers and racial tensions on top of that, it just escalates the problem. Thank you. I know local in my area, uh, now I know that they're having ref meet and greets, not just coaches meet and greets, but ref meet and greets. And for some sports, they're actually translating the handbook and the rule book in English and in Spanish. And I think in a couple other languages, Vietnamese or Cantonese or Mandarin. Um, so those are small steps uh, to make sure because there's a lot of passion out there, obviously parents. And, and, and then you add all these layers to it, you get competitiveness and it, it, it can, if it's not handled correctly, it just goes crazy from there. But really, really appreciate the question as well as the answers. Um, I also scrolled, I, you know, I, I want to be mindful of time. I seen somebody um, say that they need more professional athletes to support local sports leagues. So we have a lot of Latinos, um, either internationally born or, or, or born here in the United States. We have a lot of Latinos who have made it in some particular sports. And um, I think, I, I, look, I, I, this is a generalization. I've seen some give back and I've seen some maybe give back to their home country. Um, what, 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 what could be done to promote professional athletes to support local sports? Um, I, I'll just, I'll leave it at that. Yeah, um, I, I have some experience in that actually. Um... And I would say maybe first step would be reaching out to the, the club or, or organization team they're a part of, building the relationship there. Um, we have been fortunate enough that that in San Diego, some of the professional uh, soccer players are from the neighborhood. So they're they're willing to come back and, and give back and um, talk to our young kids about about the space. But um, I think the the notion that that it was them at one point is always important, right? Um, so if you can make that contact and and really you know tug on those heartstrings that at some point they were the the kid at, at the youth tournament and and all of that and um 
you know, our young kids sometimes um, don't always need the best player of, of whatever sport it is you're playing. Like they don't need a, a Kobe Bryant or from James of basketball to show up. Right. Maybe they just need that local talent that made it big time who, you know, maybe no one knows outside of their area to come in and talk to them about their experience, how they navigated the world. Um, and that really does go a long way with the kids. Um, I've worked with professional soccer clubs and I even joke around that like our kids sometimes get so excited. They can't even tell um, if front office staff or coaches or professional players, because, you know, those people are the ones that showed up and, and talked to them about the professional space. So that alone went a long way for them. Nice. Thank you, Lupe. Dr. Estrepo. Absolutely. Um, I'm going to kind of bandwagon off Lupe a little bit. Um, I just sometimes have a hard time asking uh, individuals to make systemic changes, uh, whether it's just to, to work with a sports league or a team itself. Um, the way I think of, I approach it is more of uh, the organization that they represent. Um, if, if they're part of a team or they're a coach of a team, um, how is the organization you're part of creating systemic changes, right? Um, We've seen a lot of initiatives in professional leagues, uh, specifically in the NBA, the National Basketball League, and the Major League Baseball, of them doing Latino nights or them doing uh, the names in the jerseys with with uh, in Spanish translations um, and with uh, symbolisms of Latino culture. So when we look at support from the professional level down to the grassroots level, it's not, for me, it's not how do we ask the Latinos individually to go back and support their community. It's how do we get this system, this elite system that help, that holds so much power, mm -hmm. so much control, and so much influence over our youth, how can we get them to come and support and meet us halfway with the Latino community? Um, because I think with individualized efforts, uh, there's more barriers, there's more uh, restrictions, right? Sometimes as, a, as an individual, I worked my way up to be a professional athlete and, and the money I make from it, I may not wanna share it with the community, but if it's an organization that, that has a program or has an initiative to support the community and I could be uh, at the forefront of it or I could be the uh, figurehead of it, um, I think that's going to create more of an impact rather than just my individual efforts. Yeah, great, great response. And thank you for that perspective, because it really just sounds instead of like, like you said, like an individual, more of a collective system embracing the clientele, the constituency that is already buying their product. And so when you see, and I'll, I'll be a little biased, when you see Los Gigantes, um, I'm, I, I'm not going to say Los Doyers, even though I'd said it, that's a whole other workshop and it's a whole other conversation. But when you see he, Los Gigantes or different um, different sports teams putting on the the Spanish name of the team, I mean, that goes a long way or, or doing the whole Latino, you know, Hispanic Heritage Night or whatever. Um, I think that, that yeah, I, thank you for that. Just that goes a long way because it's more systemic rather than putting on individual players. Gracias for that. All right, we're just kind of just kind of sunsetting our time. I want to encourage you all to keep uh, your comments and your conversations. I'm trying to do my best and, and, and read them all as well as moderate the, the, the healthy conversation that we have with our two guests. Um, read this, this, this latest one. What could be done to promote non-traditional sports like ultimate frisbee that celebrates intersectionality and is widely played by college students and young professionals recreationally great question gracias uh Hervan, Hervan, Jervan, Jervan Williams I'll, uh, I'll I'll take this one and start us off um I th one way that I've I've learned um is to help increase visibility or access to a sport uh, is by making conscious and, and intentional efforts to meet uh, a Spanish language outlet, right? And so media is our big way to do that. Um, if we can engage uh, folks uh, with sport through um, either social media, television, news outlets, uh, to promote to a Spanish-speaking audience, I think that's the best way to grow visibility in a sport. Um, and, and even uh, in, in sports that are more popular, but not as niche, right? Not sports uh, like ultimate first view. But for example, American football, which is a, a, like a, an example close to me is um, the National Football League 
that didn't have any Latino initiatives for a long time, it wasn't trying to grow a Latino market, all of a sudden realized that like, hey, like we need to capitalize on, on this community and we need to capitalize on visibility by them, right? So they're making a conscious effort in being part of Spanish language media outlets. Um, and so for whether for popularized sports or for niche sports that we're trying to, you know, show more interse intersectionality, I think putting uh, representation in, in the media that we watch and see as a community, I think it's going to be very helpful. Thank you. So just using that, using the power of the media, you know, to, you know, contact like, like this is a local thing going on, maybe or maybe a regional or a statewide thing. Thank you, Dr. Lupe, anything to add? Yeah, I, I will just add, um, I think that's very important. What Dr. Restrepo said is, is meeting the community where they're at, where they're kind of getting their content from, but also celebrating your sport since it's more niche, uh, like celebrating the intersectionality that you say exists there, I think is important because it'll then just increase, you know, wanting to belong and, and you know, the interest in, in the community wanting to take part in it. Gracias. Well, I just I want to respect everybody's time. I'm just going to put out like any parting words, any parting encouragement, maybe a special initiative or event that you've got going on in your area. I just want to tell, tell, tell the audience, we've got literally the East Coast and the West Coast represented here. We've got SoCal down in San Diego. We got Boston, Massachusetts. Um, and I'm a little bit biased to the West Coast, but no disrespect to the East Coast, but I'm just going to put it out there. Um, but any any parting words, Dr. Estrepo, Lupe, uh, about just the conversation, or maybe you're seeing some of the comments that are that are been putting out. I'll just leave you with uh, two minutes each. With anything you want to say to the rest of the group as we sunset our time? Yeah, um, I would say you know support organizations that are working against the pay to play model. Support grassroots organizations that are in the community. Uh, hiring folks from the community so that they're the kids are represented in these spaces. Um, like Chicano Federation, the organization I work for um, and, and the work that we do, we have a celebration called Celebrando Raices coming up this month. Um, you can visit our website and get tickets or you can always donate to our organization to, to support our work in the space. Um, outside of soccer, we also do a lot of other social services uh, that families obviously very much need. What's a, tell, tell us the website, Lupe. Chicanofederation.org. Chicanofederation.org. Get down. Thank you. Dr. Restrepo, take us out. Well, I just want to thank everybody for this opportunity. Uh, I know a lot of us on this call are already very involved in sport and um, youth advocacy. Um, and so let's continue, right? And each effort that we do, we're creating an impact in one shape, way, or another. Um, and so I commend every single one of us on this call for putting such uh, so much passion and love into what we're doing. Um, I just want to give a quick shout out to an uh, organization called Audible Football Corporation. AudibleFootballCorporation.com uh, is the website. Uh, what we do is we help um, American football teams outside of the United States that want to grow the sport, that want to take on a new sport with the resources and capacities that they need. Uh, we've done football, American football camps in, in Latino America for the last seven years now. Uh, we've been in Bogota, Colombia, Medellin, Colombia, Quito, Ecuador, among other places. Um, and so we're, you know, we realize that lot, all Latinos don't just play soccer or baseball or, or boxing, right? We play other sports too. And so um, there's power in network. There's power in knowing people. There's power in, in collaborating with people that maybe just have a different lane than you do, but we could bounce ideas off each other. Um, and so anybody that is looking for network and support, um, uh, we highly encourage that because that's how we work together as a team. Como se llama? How do you say it? Audible Football Corporation. Uh, honorable, spell it out for me. Audible, A-D-U-B-I-L-E. A-D-U-I, -E. oh. okay. Audiblefootball dot. AudibleFootballCorporation.com. AudibleFootballCorporation.com and ChicanoFederation.org. Get down. Well, I want to just give it up. Look, y'all throw some emojis out there or clap or whatever for Lupe, for Dr. Restrepo. Want to uh, just shout out my colleagues from PCA, Reggie, Rashida, and Shannon, who are doing behind the scenes stuff. 
want to give all respect to everybody that joined us today for this webinar. Muchas gracias. That that's my that's my computer that just said two o'clock. Muchas gracias for, to everybody. Um, keep on keeping on. Si se puede. Uh, proud of all you and and, and make sure uh, you, you 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 put yourself out there. Be bold. Stand up. Represent your community. Muchas gracias. Um, and have a great uh, Hispanic Heritage Month for the next thirty days. All right. Eat eat a eat eat whatever food is good for you. All right. Represent. Yeah. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thanks y'all.